one author, one community event. This program is made possible by the Washington County Wildwood Branch Library with monies from the Minnesota Cultural Heritage Fund and is co-sponsored by Matamida Community Education. My name is Vicki Fleming, and I'm a member of the 2018 Organizing Committee for Matarida. Members meet about six times a year to discuss candidate books and authors and do the work of organizing this event. I invite any of you who are interested in joining our committee, as I did this past year, to speak to any of us wearing nameplates. We'll be in the lobby after the presentation, and we'll be happy to answer your questions and exchange information so that you can join us. <clears throat> Most years, our Matarida selection identifies a single title. Our selected author this year defies limitation to one genre, much less to one book. Allison McGee writes for all ages and all forms, from novels to poems to books for children. Her Pulitzer Prize-nominated novel, Shadow Baby, was a Today Show book club pick, and her picture book for adults, Someday, was a number one New York Times bestseller. Her work has been translated into more than 20 languages, and she has won dozens of fellowships and awards, including four Minnesota Book Awards, the Geisel Medal, State and Loft Artist Fellowships, a Christopher Award, a McDowell Residency, and several American Library Association Awards. <clears throat> Allison grew up south of Old Forge in the foothills of the Adirondacks, has three grown children, and lives a semi-nomadic life in Minneapolis, Vermont, and California. Her most recent novel is What I Leave Behind, which came out in May, and another Adirondacks novel, tentatively titled Choose, will be published next fall. Please join me in welcoming Allison McGee. Thank you. Is this on? Oh, yeah. It's so on. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for coming out on this cold and rainy night. I am so impressed by you. I was thinking I would probably just stay home. <laughs> but I am so grateful that you didn't. Um, so thank you, and thanks for that beautiful introduction. I know that this is the 16th year this has been going. That is so impressive. and. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, when I looked at the list of authors who have spoken in the past, so many of them are my friends. And that is one of the amazing things about this state is, am I ringing or am I OK? okay. One of the most amazing things about this state is its arts and its literature. It's known to people who, who live on the coasts as this sort of literary mecca. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be here. So tonight I thought, um, because I'm the, the one author for all these ages, I thought I would talk about my three most recent books and give you all kinds of secrets uh, in terms of the backstory and the inspiration for each, read a little bit uh, from them, and then if you had any questions about these books, the writing process, or any of my other books, I would be more than happy to try to answer them. Um, does that sound like a plan? All right, so we're going to go backward. We're going to go backward in time uh, in chronology of these books. This one, Dear Sister, is my brand new little baby. It was just published in October last month, and so it's just making its way into the world. Um, this book began life in my mind uh, four years ago when the youngest of my three children, who will be known for our purposes tonight as little sister, big sister, and brother, because I feel a weird compulsion to protect the guilty. <laughs> <clears throat> Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, dear sister, four years ago, my youngest went to college and Honestly, I just felt heartbroken. I cannot even begin to tell you that I felt this great new sense of freedom, and I just felt heartbroken. And uh, I didn't know how to cope <laughs> with, 
with the fact that, you know, it was just over. Their childhoods were over. She was in New Hampshire. My older daughter was in Boston. My son was in Chicago. It's like, oh, wow. And uh, I would come in the house, there would be the dog, there would be the cat, and we'd all just kind of look at each other. <laughs> and uh, as long as I thought, as Allison, as long as your heart is broken, you might as well just be heartbrokenly productive <laughs> and do something that you've avoided doing their whole lives, which is pull out those giant cardboard boxes that I used to just toss their trophies and school photos and, you know, little papers. I just tossed them, these big saggy things. And I knew that if I went through them, I would feel heartbroken, but I was already heartbroken. So why not organize them nicely? I went to Target. I bought those nice big plastic bins with the cupboard covers, and I thought, I'll just make a nice bin for each one. And so I hauled them all out in the living room. Dog and cat are sitting there. And I start going through them. And it was heartbreaking, and it was also just so beautiful. There, was, there were their school photos from kindergarten, and there was you know, their favorite stuffed animals, and their little blankies, and oh. And there were also notes <laughs> that they had written to each other. And I had forgotten all about these notes. And um, I'll just show you a couple of them. So. Let me lay the scenario. Brother is maybe 11, 12, old enough to take care of little sister, who's six or seven, and I have to go teach. And I'm so happy that I've gotten to this, this point in their lives where I have this responsible son, and they all get along so well, and when I go teach my four-hour class, I don't have to hire a babysitter. I can just say to son, okay, I'm gonna go teach. I want you to take care of little sister. No TV, TV was a no in our house. No snacks, because sister's weight was 90% dry, salty, crunchy carbohydrates. No snacks. No TV, read her books, play with her, board games. I'll be home, I'll cook dinner, everything will be good. Sound good? Sure, Mom, no problem. So off I go. Securing the knowledge that my family is well cared for. In Uptown, this is an important part of the story, we live in Uptown, Minneapolis. All houses, and then two blocks away, all the greatness of Uptown, you know, the lakes and the stores and the restaurants, and all my kids' friends always wanted to meet in Uptown. Okay, file that in the back of your head. So I come back from teaching, I walk in the door. What do I find but little sister on the couch, surrounded with her stuffed animals, her blankies, <laughs> open bags of pretzels and crackers and chips, TV blaring. She's clearly been there for hours, happier than I've ever seen her. <laughs> well, well, well. Where's your brother? Oh. So, I go into the kitchen, and on the fridge, I'm just gonna describe this to you, okay? I find this note. Sister, in Uptown, watch TV. <laughs> Brother, okay, fine. Clearly, I have failed in my parenting. More evidence of my failure came a few weeks later. This was just sad. Little sister from day one adored Big Sister. Big Sister was three years old when Little Sister, Little Sister's adopted, when she came home. And in the photos from that first day, there are these beautiful black and white photos. Little Sister, who was always smiling and laughing, is sitting in a bouncy seat, just reaching up to Big Sister, smiling and laughing, and Big Sister is like, <laughs> thinking, my perfect life has just been ruined. And the big sister sort of disdained little sister for a number of years, despite all my coaching 
and admonitions. You know, you have got to be nice to her. Someday your father and I will be gone and you will be all you have. <laughs> you have no idea how precious your sister is to you and you will know it someday. And in the meantime, you have to play with her and be nice to her. So let's fast forward a few weeks. It's a Saturday, we're all home. And I notice that little sister seems to be spending most of her day doing chores for big sister. Cleaning up after her art projects, making her bed, bringing her little snack plates. So I go to big sister and I say, what's going on here? Mom, you're always telling me to be nice to her. I'm including her. I'm playing with her. Hmm. Later, what do I find? So carefully printed in this poor little seven-year-old's terribly misspelled handwriting. Dear big sister, I'm glad to be your servant for the day until we go to bed from little sister. <laughs> I texted this photo to my older daughter a couple weeks ago, no comment. <laughs> she sent back a string of emojis, most of them horrified face, grinning face, horrified face, grinning face. <clears throat> and so remember, I'm heartbroken, right? But I'm also remembering my kids weren't always like this perfect threesome like I have made myself remember them as. There were a lot of years where Big Sister was not that nice to Little Sister. One day something changed when Big Sister went to high school and Little Sister was in middle school. It was like a switch flipped and suddenly Big Sister, just as I predicted, could see the wondrousness that was her little sister and they've been just like that ever since. And a few months into this transformation, I said to Little Sister, I am so happy to see this relationship now with your big sister. I, I just, I can't believe it. And she looked up and said, shh, Ma, don't jinx it. I've been waiting for this all my life. So it was at that point that I thought, what if I wrote a book about siblings that consisted only of notes, just notes from one sibling to his little sibling who was born when he was eight years old, and what if it covered 10 years until the day he goes to college? And so that was my impetus for Dear Sister. And I'll read to you just a little bit from it, I'll describe, since you can't see, um, I will describe to you the picture. Brother and sister are known just as brother and sister in this book. Brother is eight, one little sister is born. The parents are referred to as they, them, and occasionally the wardens. <laughs> the wardens are always asking brother to make birthday cards for sister, to make drawings and notes for her baby book. And so the day she's born, dear sister, they told me to draw a picture of you for your baby book. Here you go. It's this baby crying so hard that tears are flooding out and like stink lines are rising. <laughs> it's just like a giant mouth saying, wah! <laughs> Even though it is not my fault that you look like this, they decided not to put my picture of you in your baby book. Three months later, dear sister, they told me to write you a three months old note for your baby book. Here you go, from brother. P.S. The reason I signed it from is because I'm not sure I love you yet. <laughs> Time will tell. P.P.S. Baby crying so hard she has to stand on a dike to avoid being swept away. P.P.S. It's not looking good so far. <laughs> Fast forward another three months. 
Dear sister, in my school, they give everyone a progress report twice a year. Here's your half year progress report. Crying, excellent. <laughs> Diaper issues, excellent. Poking brother in eye, excellent. Spitting up on brother, excellent. Pulling brother's hair, excellent. A couple years have passed. Sister is learning to talk. Dear sister, Joe, Joe is brother's best friend, Joe and I sincerely apologize for teaching you to say all those inappropriate words. <laughs> sincerely, brother. P.S. The sincere apology above is a prepared statement that the wardens made us sign. <laughs> P.P.S. In our defense, who knew you would start shouting those words in church? <laughs> Another year or so has passed. Sister is three or four. The picture is brother on the basketball court. Dear sister, I sincerely apologize for yelling at you at my basketball game. Sincerely, brother. P.S. The sincere apology on the previous page is a prepared statement that the wardens made us sign. P.P.S. In my defense, no one else's little sister came running out of the court halfway through the first quarter screaming, my ball, my ball, my ball. <laughs> it's sister's fifth birthday, and a painful incident has just occurred that has happened to every one of us. Everyone just wants to go to the bathroom behind a closed door in private, and sometimes that closed door comes open. So here's the picture. Brother is just trying for a little privacy. Here's his birthday card. Dear sister, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, person who doesn't know the meaning of the word privacy. <laughs> happy birthday to you from brother. All right, this is our last selection. A bunch of years have passed. Sister is probably eight years old. Brother is 16 or so. Sister, who lives for brother's attention, has her back turned to him in bed. She is clearly in pain. Brother is standing worried in the doorway. Dear sister, I'm sorry your stomach hurts. P.S., I mean it. Next page, brother is staging a protest. His sign says, let us stay. Dear sister, they should let brothers stay in the hospital when their sisters have appendicitis. P.S. Tell you what, when you come home from the hospital, I will be your servant for one entire day until bedtime. <laughs> See, you have the insider scoop. Dear sister, please feel better soon. Please, 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 from the brother who loves you. At least sometimes. Well, as I was working on this book, which I had so much fun writing, I suddenly flashed back to my own family. I am the oldest of four. There was me. There was my sister Laurel, born one year later. There was my sister Holly, born a year after that. So three girls, boom, boom, boom. Parents are done. Seven years later, what to our wondering eyes should appear? <laughs> Baby Dougie. <laughs> Baby Dougie comprises most of my fifth grade diary. Oh, my brother is so cute. Baby Dougie is the cutest brother in the world. I can't wait to get home and play with Baby Dougie. So as a nine-year-old, I had a lot of responsibility. We grew up way out in the country. We were country kids. We had a lot of responsibility to begin with, but we had a lot of responsibility for our brother. And I remember, and I am admitting this to you because I did confess it to my brother. <coughs> I used to have to give him his bottle. And so picture this, me, nine years old, in the recliner. 
Here's the bottle. I don't know if they make this kind of bottle anymore, but it was it like a hollow exoskeleton and you f with a no bottom and you filled a plastic bag with milk and you dropped it in and you put the lid on. They still make them? Okay. <clears throat> so here's me feeding baby doggy, thinking, oh, I just love him so much. He's so sweet. He drinks this so slowly. <laughs> Been really nice to be outside playing. I would put my finger on the bag and just press down <laughs> so the milk would kind of squirt and it'd be like, mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know if you can see this. He's so cute, but his eyes look slightly suspicious and wary. <clears throat> yeah. So my brother... <laughs> I feel so bad. My, my brother grew up <laughs> fine. He didn't choke or anything. And uh, he lives just a couple miles from me in Minneapolis. And we are just incredibly close. We talk to each other every day. I have assigned an insane piano tune to his uh, ringtone. So when he calls, I pick up, brother, sister, can you talk? So we have this brother-sister thing going, too. And so I think all of all the sibling relationship thing just funneled itself into this book of mine, Dear Sister. And uh, it's still so new in the world, but it seems to make kids laugh and laugh. Uh, and it seems to make grown-up siblings um, tear up, <clears throat> which tends to be a theme with most of my books. So Dear Sister, now you know the backstory. All right, let's see now. What I Leave Behind. This is a novel for uh, young adults and adults. Um, it stars, this came out in May. And it stars my boy, Will. He is 16 years old. He lives in downtown Los Angeles. He works in a dollar store and um, Will is a walker. He walks and walks and walks. At night, when his mom has an overnight shift at the hospital, <clears throat> he walks back and forth to his job at the dollar store where his boss is named Major Tom. He's named him Major Tom. He walks past the homeless man um, that he has befriended, whose name is Superman. He walks past a little kid who's always out in his backyard looking for butterflies that he calls the little butterfly dude. He walks past um, a dog who has spent his entire life on a chain going back and forth in his backyard that he calls the dog of insanity because why wouldn't you be insane? Uh, and Will is, is trying to figure out some things in his life. Three years ago, his dad died of suicide. <clears throat> And three weeks ago, his, his childhood friend, uh, Playa, was um, assaulted at a party. And this book, this book probably came into my heart a long, long time ago, in my 20s, when my boyfriend died of suicide. And I felt at that point that suddenly I was like my life had, had ended and suddenly I was having to live this new life at an age that all my, nothing like this had happened to any of my friends. And I was too young to look forward in life and realize that this kind of thing happens to everybody in time. But it hadn't happened to anyone else, and I suddenly felt like I had left all my friends behind somehow, and that I had to figure things out on my own. I had to figure out how I was, I was gonna stay alive, really. And the way I did it back then was, um, I decided that there was no future. I decided I would, I would uh, pretend there was no future. There really isn't any future. We live like there is, but we don't know if there is or not. And I would live uh, 15 minutes at a time. So 
all that I had to get through was 15 minutes. I'd wake up, and I'd have that moment before I remembered what had happened, and I'd feel just normal, and then it would all come down again. <clears throat> but all I had was 15 minutes to get through, so I could get up, I could go to the bathroom, I could brush my teeth, I could make coffee, I could get dressed, 15 minutes. Okay, then all you have is 15 minutes to get through. So, you know, you just, this was how I made it through that first stretch of time after <clears throat> the suicide. And I also became a walker. Um, I, would, I lived in Boston at the time, so I would walk out of my apartment and I would walk along the Charles River five miles down to Harvard Square, cross the bridge, five miles back on the other side, cross the bridge. I would just walk and walk and walk. And like Will, I, would, I knew regulars on my route. There was a guy I called Kilt Man because he was massively tall and he wore a kilt always. And he ate a dozen egg, hard-boiled eggs a day. And um, I still think about Kilt Man. But wherever I walked, he was walking too. And uh, Kilt Man, his eyes never really focused on you. He was just walking and eating eggs and walking and eating eggs. And uh, even though I was supposedly a perfectly you know, typical and sane person, I recognize something in Kilt Man and his endless walking and my endless walking. We're both trying to get through something. And um, so Will, after what happened to his dad, there are places he can't walk. He can't walk past the bridge that his dad jumped from. He can't walk by the Chinese blessing store that he and his dad always used to go to. It's a store run by a woman named Mrs. Lin, and in the back of it, there's a case, and there's 100 blessings in the case that you can buy for a dollar each, and there are things like a candle to light at night for peace, and something, a candle that will make a cloud of safety around you. And Will and his dad always used to study those blessings. Um, and he works in a dollar store. So um, because I don't know how to write a book unless I give myself an assignment, like Dear Sister was, oh, write a book that consists only of letters from one sibling to another. For this book, I decided all I had was a vague idea that a teenager's friend was in trouble and he wanted to help her. But I wanted the book to feel like a poem so intense and so distilled and just pure in a way. And so I knew that that meant the book had to be very slender and just spare and there could be no wasted words. And I thought one way I could do that was, would be to give myself an assignment of writing 100 passages that were very short and very just no bullshit at all. And so that was my framework for the book. He worked in a dollar store. There's a case with 100 blessings, 100 little passages. So I was playing off this theme of 100 the whole time. And then as I was working on the book, and I was, I was obsessed with this book. I, it was the only thing I wanted to do. It was the only thing I did all one winter in California. And I went to LA, and I would walk around and take photos of the route that Will would, would walk on his travels. Um, I thought, you know what, you could push this all the way and you could make this novel 100 chapters of 100 words each precisely. You could have a 10,000 word novel. And nobody ever needs to know that, but it was a cool thing for me to do. Um, so that's what I did. And I had an image of the book as having some sort of a visual image on one side of the page and then the passage of writing on the other. And what ended up happening was that uh, the publisher hired a Chinese calligrapher to do the numbers one through 100 for each of the chapters. So my mom wrote me a couple weeks ago and said, honey, guess what? I am teaching myself how to write Chinese one through 100, which you actually can do with this book. <clears throat> So when something terrible happens to you, I guess any age, but especially when you're young, I think you can, 
you can do, you can react one of two ways. You can turn inward and you can close up and you can think, I can never suffer this way again. So I'm just going to make my life a little narrower and I'm going to make my heart a little tougher. Or you can turn outward and you can look around and see that there is nothing unique about this terrible pain I'm in. And it's so terrible that everybody suffers, but it's also a, a means of connection in a way that everyone does. And so I think it can make you softer and it can, it can make your heart more open. And so our boy Will uh, chooses the latter. He pushes out into the world and he decides he's going to try to make the world a better place. Um, and he's going to begin with his friend who was assaulted, his dear friend, Playa. Um, so I'm going to read to you just a little bit, a few passages from Will, What I Leave Behind. He works at a dollar store called Dollar Only. His boss is Major Tom. Chapter one, E. You ever had real cornbread? Like from a cast iron skillet stuck in the oven to preheat while you mix the batter? A hot, hot oven. So hot that before you open the door, you have to put oven mitts on your hands. And when you take the cast iron skillet out, you pour in a little melted butter and it hisses. The skillet's that hot. And then you pour in the batter and it starts to brown and puff around the edges even before you put the skillet back in. That kind of cornbread, that's the kind I mean. R. You got your various cornbreads, my dad used to say. You got your non-sweet northern, southern, your Swedish northern, and then you got your dad's cornbread. The way he said it, it was like he was speaking in bold fa face. You know, dad's cornbread. He used to put it together from a recipe in his head. Maybe I'll try to make it tonight. I do that sometimes, try to recreate the recipe try to make it come out the way his did. I keep the cast iron skillet in my closet. Eggs in the fridge, butter, no milk, but that's okay. Water works. Son, sometimes you gotta walk the day out of you. You know, walk it right out through the soles of your feet. Dollar only is closed now. My shift is over. It's Tuesday night, which means my mom's got the overnight shift and she's not gonna notice if I'm not home. The night and its sidewalks are right out that door. Ring out the mop, empty the bucket, sign out. Say goodbye to Major Tom, waiting to lock up and exit out the back door to his car. Major Tom, he's not a walker. Most people aren't, but I am. So, tonight, the air itself is dark. That happens sometimes. It's not just the lack of sun, it's the presence of darkness. If you're a walker, a real walker, your feet can figure out the right route. Sometimes the right route is one that goes past the places you love, like the cathedral, like the park off Whittier, like the Grand Central Market and its stalls. Sometimes the right route is the route not past other places, places you maybe love but can't walk by right now like Playa's house, like the Blessing Store, like the River Bridge over 4th Street. Woo. Let your feet find the way. You'll know it when they do. Then let the day drain out of you. Let whatever comes into your head just float around in there. What's in there tonight? Cornbread. Black cast iron cornbread, like my dad used to make. And that raggy little blanket Playa used to carry to school in her backpack back in elementary school. And the case in the back of the blessing store, a hundred blessings all numbered in Chinese. To unbreak your broken heart, to make a cloud of safety around you, to light at night for peace. <clears throat> That's 5% of the book right there. <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
All right, finally. This was published a year ago, just came out in paperback, Never Coming Back. So the backstory of this book, oh my goodness, it began uh, 20 years ago when um, I was writing my second novel. And again, because I don't know how to write a book unless I give myself an assignment, I made a list of random objects off the top of my head. And on the list were, <clears throat> some of the things were an onion, a bloody shoe, a dented tin object, a broken colander, the spiced ginger, a white plate with an orange border, a dark green miniature sink, a cookie cutter, and I cheated because this was not off the top of my head, a fake book report. <clears throat> And my rule, my assignment for that book, Shadow Baby, was that all those objects had to go in the book by the time it was finished. So you can see how this is great, because if a bloody shoe has to go in the book, well, you can start writing a scene that has a bloody shoe in it and just see where it might go. Make sense? It's a place to start. So um, the fake book report was not random. The fake book report was how I got through my childhood because <clears throat> I loved to read more than anything else, but I could not stand to write book reports because it was like it took the book and just like crushed it into this, into this just, oh, it, oh, oh. <laughs> I grew up um, reading Reader's Digest condensed books do, anybody familiar with them? <laughs> so we would get one every month, and it would be a big, thick book, but it would it contain like six novels that had been condensed. And I was a kid. I had no idea. I would just read them all and think they were all great, but they all felt a little thin. <laughs> and they literally were thin, thin books. And that's what writing a book report felt like to me. So my way around it was to make up an imaginary book and then write a real book report about the imaginary book. And that worked great. The problem was I was obsessed with pioneer children and covered wagons heading westward, so most of my books were about pioneer girls. Uh, but because that was on my list, then I could start writing this novel. And so I began writing one of my fake book reports from childhood. You know, it was the winter of 1879, and Sarah Martin knew true cold. You know, the, the blizzard had trapped Ma and Pa in town, and Bessie and Snowball were in the stable, and <laughs> she was twisting corn into sticks to, you know. Um, and as I was writing that, I thought, this is great. I'll be able to get my 1,000 words out of the way, you know, give yourself a word quota per day by writing this, and then I'll be done. Then I got this image of this girl uh, at the school desk just frantically, angrily scribbling on this yellow legal pad. And I instantly realized that that girl was the one who was writing the book report, and she was the narrator of my novel. And she just wrote the whole novel and her name was Clara Winter. And uh, I loved that girl, and I loved her mother. And I wrote that book 18 years ago, and uh, in all this time, I have tried to figure out what Clara was doing, and I wanted her to be a forest ranger in the Adirondack Mountains so badly. I could just see her sitting on top of a fire tower, looking out, and at one point, I. I forced her, I wrote 80 pages of Fire Ranger Clara, and I finally had to just admit it was terrible, and she clearly wasn't a Fire Ranger, but I didn't know where she was. So, fast forward a few years ago, I wanted to write a novel about a mother-daughter relationship, um, because I, I have a great, relationship with my mother, but I know so many of my women friends whose relationships with their mothers are 
so filled with love and so fraught with ah, tension and unresolved things. And it just seemed like such an, uh, a rich relationship to write about. And uh, so I didn't know what the book was about other than what I wanted it to be about. And so I went back to my random object listing and I made a little list to get myself going. <clears throat> and on it was a carton of orange juice. And so I put the orange juice on a counter in my mind, and I had a hand reach out and pick it up, and then I just wrote down what happened. And the hand carried it out to a living room, and there was an older, a middle-aged woman deadheading geraniums that she had moved indoors for the winter. And the hand holding the orange juice went like this and said, Ma? I found this in the dishes cupboard, and right then I, I knew that that was Clara because she's the only person I've ever known who called her mother Ma. My son calls me Ma, strangely enough. And I thought, oh, wow, this is Clara. I'm going to find out what she's up to. And uh, that's what happened. <clears throat> and what happened was that it turns out her mother, who's only 18 years older than her, uh, had, had just been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer. And uh, this made me very sad <laughs> because I loved Tamara and I didn't want her to have to go through that and I didn't want either of them to have to go through that because their relationship had always been tense and distant and so filled with love that was just unspoken, and they could not really understand each other in many ways. And so the book became almost a mad dash to figure out that relationship and resolve the tensions in it, and for Clara to get to know her mother before it was too late, um, because it's such a cruel disease, as you all know. <clears throat> and it seems to go faster if it's early onset. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, and so the book was a race against time. And it was also, it felt like a race for me too, because I didn't know anything about what had happened to these two in all those intervening years. It had been 20 years since Clara wrote Shadow Baby, and now she was 32 years old. What had she been through? And what had Tamar been through? Um, and so it was a, it was a very poignant, book for me to write. It was, um, I, I went back to my, my roots again. All my adult novels have been set in the Adirondacks where I grew up, the foothills of the Adirondacks. And it's a place that I left when I was 18 um, for college and literally never went back to, I have never been back for more than a week since. Uh, never went back in the summer, just never went back. And it's, <clears throat> I, I loved growing up where I grew up. I always thought I would live in the country. I couldn't imagine living in a city. I, and yet, in retrospect, the day I got to college, it just felt like suddenly I was in my world and I had found my people and my life, in a way, was beginning. And I look back on that, on my childhood, and much of it feels as though I was waiting without knowing that I was waiting. And much of Clara's life reflects, um, reflects that aspect of my life. It's a, it's a strange thing to grow up in a place and, and love it so much, love the beauty of it, the remoteness of it, uh, and know that you don't, you don't belong there. And uh, that, that is a theme that I've explored with, with little Miss Clara. So I will read to you just a couple pages from Never Coming Back. <clears throat> Clara is narrating. She's 32. Now that my mother was disappearing, I wondered when it began to happen. A few months before her neighbor called to tell me something was wrong, or maybe years ago, when I was in my nomadic 20s and home only once or twice a year, or did something inside her change in a single moment? Quit working, decide enough was enough. 
It's hard to say, hard to know. But happen it did. And when I left the southern wild and moved back north, it was not to be with her exactly. Because where exactly are you when you begin to disappear? Where do your thoughts go and the words you once used to express them? Are they still inside you somewhere? Not that she was ever big on words to begin with, my mother. Was big on words? Had ever been big on words? Is, was, are, were. These were the days of mixed up tenses. When Sylvia the nurse called and said, she is, was agitated. She is, was looking for you. She is, was having a tough time. I could get in the car and be there in an hour. They felt my presence would help and it did. That was what they told me anyway, which was something that surprised me. There are many surprises. You're coming back north, Clara, Sunshine said. Why? I mean, that's fantastic, but why? Have you forgotten that north is where winter lives? Brown said, the land of snow and ice, the season of your discontent. That was Sunshine, my best friend, and Brown, her husband, and my other best friend. I pictured them sharing the phone next to their bed, both ears pressed against the receiver. They had cell phones, but they still used a landline, both upstairs and down. That was what happened when you lived in the Adirondacks, a place where cell service was spotty and things that elsewhere seemed essential weren't. Their phones were heavy and black like old time phones because that was what they were, old time phones, bought at a garage sale for a dollar a piece. Sunshine and Brown liked weight and heft, or maybe what they liked was permanence. Shut up about Winter Brown, Sunshine said. Don't scare her away. If she moves back north, she has to live here, Brown said. And absolutely, Sunshine said. They were talking to each other in low tones, as if I couldn't hear them on the other end of the line. This was not uncommon. In Old Forge, I said, duh. They were still speaking in the same time, at the same time. They both put the same exclamation mark at the end of the duh. Have you two merged, become a single entity? Can you no, no longer speak for yourselves? No, no, and yes, Sunshine said, and Old Forge, Brown said again, Old Forge is where you should live. They knew my mother, and they had known her for a long time, but I hadn't said a word to them or to anyone about what was happening to her, about the fact that she was the reason I was even thinking of moving back. Tell no one, my mother had said, and no one had I told, not even Sunshine and Brown, but it was late that night, and Monkey Mind had taken over, and I was wandering around in the dark until I figured out what to do. My mother was disappearing, and I didn't know what to do didn't know how to keep her with me in this world, on this plane of existence, <clears throat> thinking and talking the way I had always known her to think and talk. Sunshine and Brown were the people I'd called because they were my best friends. And because even if they were already asleep, they would answer the phone if it rang. That was the kind of people they were. They were the kind of people who had always been there. What happens when someone close to you starts to disappear? is that they aren't always there. They are with you, and then they aren't. This happens while their hearts still beat, while their lungs still breathe, while they look directly at you. They talk and laugh and sing, and then they don't. They are here and they are gone, are and were, simultaneously. Did I wake you guys up? No, kind of, who cares? Each of them speaking over the other. <clears throat> Old Forge, I said again, like it was a place I'd never been to before, a kind of mythical place that existed on another planet. Old Forge, they said, we're here. Old Forge isn't home. It's half an hour north of Stearns. That makes it homish. Old Forge, where my mother used to take me once a year in the summer. We went swimming in Fourth Lake. We had pancakes at Key's Pancake House. We spent hours wandering through the multi-roomed palace of Adirondack hardware. We went to the water park, where once another mother, a mother who wasn't my mother, 
took a Polaroid picture of me sitting inside Cinderella's giant pumpkin and gave it to us. <clears throat> Old Forge was our big summer adventure. Now I thought, why did we go only once a year? Since it was so close to home, we could have gone there every week if we wanted, every day for God's sake. Old forget, I said. That's what I used to call it when I was a kid. I used to think of it as this magical place. It is a magical place, Sunshine said. We're magical, aren't we? And we're here. Come home, Clara. Yeah, Brown said. Come homish. So homish, I came. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to try to answer them about these books, writing process, other books. Yes. So I remember your assignments with the one word, and you put them all together, and you have to make put them all in one story. Um, I also, um, so Kao Kalia Yang um, graduated from my the high school that I teach at. And from, Louise from Erdrich, Harvard. From Harvard. Yeah. Yes. And then um, Louise Erdrich, we also. Anyway, so when I talked to them, we have an author at our school um, who wrote the Eddie, Joe Padalo. Uh -huh. And we, I talked to them about the writing process and how when you speak, you speak a lot about how much you of your own self you put into um, your writing. And to, I always ask everybody who is, does you know, go and publish their work, when I read people's work like Kao Kalia's or um, Joe Padley's or your work, I see you inside of that. Is, that. is that scary at all to put like, part of yourself out there for like, the world to like, see? Is it, the question, is it scary to really put yourself into a book that then is in the world. <clears throat> oh, you know, it, it is because I'm really a private person. Um, and I've never, I, the only place I write memoirs is on my blog. But I also know that the only way a book is going to really reach someone is if you put your heart on the line. So. I, I actually have that taped to my computer. Put your heart on the line. Whatever you write, put your heart on the line. And that means, that means doing just that. And it, even if almost nothing I write about is a personal experience that happened to me, but there is an emotional truth to it that you have to dig in and haul that up. You know, I have this bit emoji with pink hair, and half of her bitmoji things are her, like reaching in with her heart and holding it out, and I think, that's creepy and kind of accurate at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, it's hard. Um, because you are, uh, you're putting yourself out there, yeah. Edna St. Vincent Millay, um, poet and writer, once said that uh, any writer who wants to get published or who is willing to get published is willing to stand up in public uh, naked. And there's, there's truth to that. And you can tell when someone isn't doing that. You know, it, it rings false because as human beings, we just connect to each other on a very deep emotional level when we are just honest with each other. <clears throat> There's a performance artist that I like. Her name is Marina Abramovic. Anyone heard of her? She had a project. Um, I don't know the name of it, but performance artists are always, they are physically in the, their art. And this particular performance was a table and two chairs and Marina sitting on one. You can use YouTube this and see it. And in the other chair, a stranger would just come sit down and they just looked at each other, and sometimes for a very, very long time. And you can just see the connection that is growing between these two people who have no agenda other than just to connect somehow. And I think there's a truth to that in, in writing as well.
Anything else? Yes. Do you have time to read yourself? And if so, who are your favorite authors besides yourself? <laughs> I'm not my favorite author. <laughs> Do I have time to read and who are some of my favorite authors? Oh, you know, I always joke that my dream job would be getting paid to read and not write book reviews, not do it, just lie on my couch and read. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like perfection? Yeah, I read all the time. I'm a very slow reader, uh, which is a, kind of a curse for a writer, but I read everything outside, out loud in my head, or sometimes even out loud, and so it takes a long time for me to get through a book. Um, I, re I will read anything. Novels, some of my favorite novelists are um, Ann Patchett, Ann Tyler, um, Kazuo Ishiguro, um, Murakami, Haruki Murakami, uh, Michael Cunningham. Oh, geez, I just have so many. I get flooded, my brain gets flooded. I also love great memoirs. I just finished one that I loved uh, called Educated by Tara Westover. Growing up uh, in a deeply fundamentalist and very scary Mormon family in rural Idaho, that's a great book. Similar to Glass Castles by Jeanette Walls, if anybody enjoyed that book. And <clears throat> I just finished Under the Banner of Heaven, like long after everybody else read it. And uh, that one was a tough one, so I chased it by reading all four of Jason Reynolds' young adult track novels. I read one a day, that's warp speed for me, but they're actually not that difficult to get through. Um, I read poems every day. I wake up and I read four poems first thing. That's the first thing I read. Um, I've been sending out a poem a week via email for 20 years. <laughs> It started just me sending a poem I love to a few friends, and it's ballooned into this thousands of people get this poem of the week. Um, and I have a little free library in front of my house that is just for poems. I print out poems I love and scroll them up, and it's take a poem. And uh, constantly having to refill my poetry hut. Um, I read The New Yorker always. I read The Sun magazine always. Uh, oh, God, I just read anything. You know. Sit on the bus and I'm just reading on my phone. And yeah, I also listen to a ton of podcasts, which is another kind of reading. Um, yeah. So no, I don't really have that much time. But who has time, you know? Nobody has time. It's just how you divide up your time. I've started making on my daily to-do list, read. And if it's on my to-do list, then I, I'll actually do it so I can cross it off. <laughs> yes? Hi, you've given us a little information on um, like giving yourself assignments to structure your writing or to you know fit into a form or something and you i hear a lot of numbers in your <laughs> writing and yeah, different like things <laughs> too yeah um what's your actual writing process do you get up every morning are you disciplined or is it like two weeks straight and or what is my writing process i do get up every morning <laughs> that's a good start to a day um you know I think I, I am very disciplined, but I don't feel it because it is still, even though I've spent my entire life being a writer, it is still a struggle to make myself write every day. And I'm just, I just feel slumped when I think, how can that even be at this stage? You still have to force yourself. I, I would still so much rather vacuum my house <laughs> than write, you know? <laughs> Oh, don't I need to do a load of laundry? <laughs> so what I do is uh, I ease into the day with my poems, cup of coffee, and then I begin trying to force myself to write. <coughs> Ideally, my writing happens in the morning, but at this point in my life, I've realized that, you know what? 
um, my obligations and schedule are different. My children are heartbrokenly grown. And uh, my day is really mine to structure as I want. And so as long as writing gets done sometime during the day until before I go to bed, I'm okay with that. And when I'm writing a novel, as I'm doing now, uh, I'm also, oh, sorry. (laughs) I have to go through the copy edits for another novel at the same time, so I'm sort of a a divided brain right now, copy editing a book that is already done and creating a brand new book. So I give myself a 1,000 words a day for the new book and uh, 30 pages of copy editing because the copy edit has to be done in two weeks. The new creation of the novel, the draft has to be done by the end of February, and that's just my own deadline. So when you work for yourself or you're an artist, you have to create your own deadlines. That's my deadline, because I spend all winter just writing, 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 and that will still give me two months to do a huge revision on it. So, and I have it, you know, if I do a 1,000 words a day, I will have 100,000 words by the end of February if you factor in the holidays that are rushing down on us. It becomes quite mechanical. And then I can take those 100,000 words and I can turn them into something that somebody else might be able to read and winnow it down to 75,000 words and rearrange them. But getting those 1,000 words written does not take me long. Getting myself to sit down and start that's the hard part, and I, it should be easier by now. I'm kind of a little bit ADD-ish, maybe. I easily, uh, easily distracted. Shiny object. <laughs> Laundry. <laughs> but they get written. Clearly, they get written. Yeah. Anything else? What do I do for fun? Well, um, I tell you one thing I do for fun that I do almost every night before I go to bed. I make myself a stiff drink, and I turn the lights off because I live in the city, you know. And there's Jordan and Blake there, and there's Kathy there. And I just put on the little twinkle lights, and then I put on my dance playlist, and I dance around my living room with my drink. You think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, oh, I'm, I love, I have just so many great friends, so I'm always like setting, I make sure I see friends at least a couple, two, three nights a week, dinner or, you know, storytelling or a movie. Um, fun has been in short supply the last couple of years, I think, you know, for a lot of people. And uh, so I try to... Um, I, you know, there's been a lot of tension that we're all, that many people hold inside themselves. And so I think any way to just sort of clear that out, you know, yoga, jogging, all those kinds of things. But really, um, I have a lot of fun with friends and my kids, even just, I love Snapchat filters. Um, I love them. <laughs> watching funny shows. <laughs> it, this sounds so dorky, but uh, <laughs> those things are fun to me. I travel a lot. I travel. Um, a few weeks ago, I had a magic spare week, and I just thought, oh, I just need, I need to drive west. And so I just drove west, and I took my America the Beautiful National Parks Pass, and I just hiked in a different national park every day. It, that was great. That was a lot of fun. I just have a lot of fun in daily life. Things are very funny. Um, (laughs) Don't you think things are just funny? (laughs) A man man on a velocipede wearing knickers rode by my house the other day. I'm I'm not kidding you. A velocipede, one of those giant one wheel and then the tiny front wheel. He was wearing knickers and like a... (laughs) A beanie hat. How can you not laugh at that? (sighs) Yeah, life is just weird and fun. 
Yes. Um, we just read Never Coming Back, and I loved it. I, I particularly wanted to hear where Sunshine and Brown came from. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. <laughs> oh, I love them too. <laughs> Sunshine and Brown just popped into my head. I, um, they're kind of, you know, they feel to me like true best friends. And I have a best friend. Uh, she's been my best friend since the day I met her. It was the first day of college, and I was standing in line to get my college ID. And the girl in front of me had these hiking boots with red laces. And I looked at them, and I thought, oh my god. She took out the original laces, and she purposely put in red laces. She is the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> and she was wearing a jean jacket that she had clearly like sewn patches on. And so I tapped her on the shoulder and said, is this where we should get our ID photos? Knowing full well that it was. She said, yes, it is. What dorm are you in? Oh, I'm in Stewart dorm. So am I. What floor? Fourth floor. Best friends from that day on. Yeah. <laughs> When I was driving over here, she left me a voicemail. And so my relationship with her feels kind of like Clara's relationship with Sunshine and Brown. Just the kind of friends where y you don't have to explain anything, you know? You just jump in, there you are. You're always going to take care of each other. Yes? to see where Clara was, where she'd been. And how did that process, like you said, the orange juice, and there was her hand. And can you talk just a little bit about that? Like, how did that get, get going? Yeah. Um, I didn't know whose hand was holding the orange juice. I just watched the hand do this, like, hmm. Um, it was when I was writing, I just kind of write down what happens to see what this book might be about. And it's when I heard this voice say, Ma, that I knew it had to be Clara. And I feel as though, um, I, I feel as though just in life, as in life, we look as though we live these linear lives where we're little babies. And then we grow up, and then we get older, and then we get old, and then our life is over. So on the outside, it looks like this linear progression. <clears throat> but the reality is it's not a, at all, because we're all the ages we ever were all held inside us at all times. It's like you go back to being nine years old. It's like a telephone switchboard operator from the 40s. You just plug right into there, and all those experiences from the most powerful experiences of your life are still all happening simultaneously inside us as human beings. And I feel the same way for my people that I've written about. I feel as though they are real people and they're living in this, this shadow world that's right here. And they're living their lives. And somehow, if I can just merge into that world sometimes, I can see what they're doing. And I couldn't do that with Clara for a very long time. Uh, but finally, finally she let me in. And I can't, I guess I can't really explain it beyond that, I, other than you set up the circumstance to allow it to happen, and then if it happens, great. And if it doesn't, well, you just be patient. Because writing is a really long-term it's a long term, it's a lifelong thing, you know, it's always available, it's always there, you can always check in again, see what's going on. Most books begin their life in me oh, years and years before um, I, I start in on the keyboard. Anything else? Yes? and yet her, Clara searching to know about her mother all at the same time. I just 
thought it was it was very good. Yeah. And I really love this book. I just want to say that. But I wondered what how you knew because you knew <laughs> about that experience. How did I uh, come to understand Alzheimer's? <clears throat> My parents do not have Alzheimer's. Um, people close to me, the parents of people close to me do. And uh, so I have sort of on the sidelines observed it in quite a few people. Um, but I also did a, a ton of research on it. A friend of mine, um, her mother had early onset Alzheimer's and uh, I interviewed her at length, and it was really helpful. Um, I did a ton of medical research to get at the medical roots and the genetic facts about Alzheimer's. Uh, and I think more important than anything, I lurked on Alzheimer's, early onset Alzheimer's caregivers online forums. I would just, they're open to the public. It's not like I was doing anything <coughs> nefarious, but I would just read over months. Certain people contributed all the time, and, and I would read about their loved ones, the progression of the disease, and just the simple, simple little details that you don't get when you're reading medical literature and that you might not get just in your personal observations. And I was so uh, moved by their compassion and by how overwhelming a disease it is and uh, by the, the, the cr details. You know, you get very, very cold later on, even though you're not cold, but you feel like you're cold. And that just felt like such a metaphor for the disease. Um, and so I'm glad to hear that you felt it, it was accurate. There's a lot of research that goes into novels, and I don't, I'm not a research person. I'd much rather make it all up, but you really cannot. You know. Yeah, you cannot for somebody like that. Yeah. Yes? On that line, there is a model for people who are making up her book reports. Absolutely. <laughs> It was one of the weirdest and proudest moments in my life when my older daughter came to me in, in fifth grade and said, Mom, would you, ki would you kill me if I like wrote a book report about an imaginary book? I just could not believe it. It was almost like genetically it had been passed down to her. <laughs> I, I could not believe my daughter was asking me that. And I said, honey, honestly, nothing would make me prouder. <laughs> <laughs> but why would she even ask that? And she was just all lit up with the idea of it. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Could you talk a little bit about the mother and why she was the way she was? <laughs> Not, I mean, before the Alzheimer's. Yeah. What was her life before that she was kind of strange? Yeah. Her friend said she was. Did you, you didn't read my first book, Shadow Baby? So Tamar, Tamar is a reserved, acerbic, you know, woman of few words. She's a deeply outdoors woman. She's lived all her life in this hard scrabble house, heated with wood that she herself chops. And <clears throat> she does everything herself, never been married, never, um, lived with anyone but her daughter. And the backstory to that is uh, she was 17 when her, her own mother died of cancer. And she graduated from high school in that little town and her dream was to head out and go to Florida. And uh, on the way to Florida, she was uh, raped at a party and she got pregnant with Clara and uh, chose to to raise her daughter. Uh, and I think her, her life had been so hard that she just kind of was stuck to the straight and narrow, you know, uh, and found it hard to 
to reach out to anyone. She did have a very best friend who loved her and knew her, and it turned out she did have a love in her life, and she was passionately adoring of her daughter, even if her daughter didn't know it until much later on. You know, I think uh, where I grew up anyway, <laughs> there's a lot of strange people. <laughs> there, there really are strange people. And uh, there's strange people everywhere. I mean, what about the velocipede man who just <laughs> rode by my house? Um, so I'm fascinated by the ways people live in the world. And Tamar's way somehow felt very familiar to me, even though it has nothing to do with the way I live. Are we done? Anyone else? You have been such a great and wonderful group. Thank you so much. Thank you.